And I must start with a, an apology. As you might realise, politics is a little bit busy <laughs> at this point in time. But I, I really wanted to come because I, I love conferences like this, mainly because I think it's a bit like one of my favourite films. Uh, who here is probably going to age me terribly to, to make this reference? Who here's watched The Witches? So we shut the doors, we take off our masks, and then the planning begins. Uh, and I am hugely grateful for the work that you do because I think it is an absolutely integral question for all of us, and frankly, when you've seen what is going on in par Parliament right now, the law has a vital role to play. And so what we are doing to engage and, and have the conversation about the kind of laws that we're creating, especially around issues around healthcare, is really, really critical. You wouldn't know it from the way in which we're having those conversations in Parliament. And there are three things I, I hope, and I come as a poacher turned game peaker, probably pheasant in this arrangement, because I'm not legally qualified, I'm, and yet I help write the law, to talk about three particular principles that I think we need to hold in our head when it comes to women and the law. And the first is about access, because actually we know that women do not get to access the law in the same way as men, on a very, very pragmatic, practical basis. The Women's Budget Group did some really, really depressing research last year about legal aid, and it showed that 85% of respondents felt that vulnerable women were not able to access the law because of the way in which legal aid has been constructed in this country. And that probably the most widespread area on which they weren't able to access the law was around pregnancy and maternity discrimination. So that first simple point, can you, if you are wronged, put it right through the courts, as is your basic human right? I know there are some people trying to remove us from the European Court of Human Rights, but I still hold to that very simple principle that everybody, and it's always people say every man should have their day in court, every woman should too. Access, first point to think about. Secondly, what happens when the law ignores women? Because that happens all the time. Now, for my sins, I stand here as the chair of the Labour Movement for Europe as well. I'm probably one of the few people left, like a, like a Japanese prisoner of war, still arguing <laughs> about our relationship with Europe. But I suspect many of you might have looked last year at a particular piece of legislation Parliament was debating called the Retained EU Law Bill with horror because we were looking at deleting 4,000 pieces of legislation. Well, I led some of the opposition to that, and I'm now, for my sins, sitting on various committees as the government is writing into UK law all those European protections. And at every single conversation, so often women are the exception, even though we are 51% of the population rather than equal partners in that process. Let me give you just one example to explain what I mean. Rolled up holiday pay. Some of you may well be aware that the government recently brought in legislation following removing our employment rights through this process that would bring in rolled up policy, even though it's illegal to be able to do that. In the conversation, the statutory instrument committee, I was the only woman in the room asking questions about what that might mean for maternity pay and what that might mean for women whose rights to maternity pay are entitled. And frankly, as it so often is when you're talking about women in Parliament, I may as well have been talking Klingon. Because people hear the word lady, and they do hear lady, they never hear women in Parliament, and, th and then it's just a blank. So you'll get an answer back, which is about ladies, if you get an answer at all. In this instance, the minister could not answer because it hadn't occurred to them there might be a challenge that if you change the way in which people have their um, holiday entitlement calculated, that might also affect their right to not have holiday entitlement taken part of maternity leave. When the minister wrote back to me, I'm pretty sure what he wrote back to me is actually technically illegal. And if I do nothing else this today, I might send you all the letter to tell me whether I'm right about that. But that's a classic example of where women are simply ignored. And the very basic day-to-day -day experiences of women are just not part of the conversation. And too often, frankly, it falls to having women in the room and being the only woman in the room to raise those questions. And frankly, that's not good enough. But as we head towards what I like to call Lady Christmas or International Women's Day, where we're told of the presents <laughs> and wonderful things that are going to be brought to us and why we all should really just frankly be grateful for what we've got, the one I really want to put on your, on your lap today to think about is when women are discriminated against, systemically discriminated against within our legal system. And the area of work that I'm working on a lot at the moment is when it comes to their reproductive rights. And I suspect in some of the work you were just talking about, 
some of that conversation has come up too. It is extraordinary to me that one in three women in this country will have an abortion, and that is an illegal act. Because you don't have a legal right to have an abortion in this country. What you have is a right not to be prosecuted if you follow a series of rules. Now, you might say, well, what does that matter? Look, basically, women can access an abortion. But actually, in the last couple of years, we've seen a dramatic increase in the numbers of women being prosecuted under the legislation that makes it illegal to have an abortion at all. 60 women prosecuted many more investigated under a piece of legislation written in the 1800s called the Offences Against the Person Act, which is also about murder, it's also about being able to throw bricks at trains, and says that having an abortion in of itself is an illegal thing to do. What does that mean in practice? It means we've seen 15-year-old girls who've had stillbirths having police turn up at their hospital bed. It means last October there was an 11-year-old girl where they had to go to court and first and foremost, the judge had to consider whether or not, as a victim of incest, she could have an abortion legally before considering whether it was in her best interest for that to happen. Increasingly, we are seeing women being persecuted for exercising what I consider to be a basic human right. It is a form of discrimination. We have a very small window before the next election in which we can make progress on this issue. We cannot do it on our own. We must do it by showing that the current system is unsustainable. First and foremost, it is those prosecutions. Many of you may be aware of the case of Carla Foster, who was a woman who, who sourced pills for herself and caused her own abortion at a late term. That has dramatically changed people's understanding of what is going on. It has also enlivened those people who believe that a woman should not be able to access an abortion at all. And it does also raise some very difficult questions about what if we do decriminalise abortion in England and Wales, we do next. That's where I come with some ways forward. Because four or five years ago now, I was involved in the campaign to decriminalise abortion in Northern Ireland. Now, in Northern Ireland, they had no access to abortion at all. That meant that you had women who were told that they had babies that would not live once they were born, forced to carry to term because they could not access an abortion. And the critical thing that we did there was not simply to repeal legislation that meant that abortion was illegal, but to put in place a lock that said, anything that comes next must uphold the human right of a woman to be able to access an abortion. Some of you may well be aware of CEDAW, the Convention on Women's Rights. CEDAW is explicit that being able to access an abortion is a human right. So the challenge that we now face in England and Wales in frankly equalising abortion access between the different nations in the United Kingdom is to learn the lessons in Northern Ireland. Because I tell you, this does not happen by accident. And why I call it discrimination is because systematically we see when it comes to women's rights, particularly women's rights under the law, we are always second-class citizens. And what we have seen on abortion, you know, people will say to you, Roe versus Wade couldn't happen here in the United Kingdom. Well, about six, seven months ago, we first got wind of what the government is now doing on buffer zones. So last year, the parliament voted to bring in buffer zones in England and Wales, a 150 metre exclusion zone around which you could not protest around an abortion clinic because if a woman has made a decision to have an abortion, the last thing she needs is somebody standing in her way telling her that she's wrong or offering to pray for her. That is not freedom of expression. This government has now introduced a consultation which overturns buffer zones. And it's been able to do that because we have not had the same argument here in England and Wales that abortion is a human right. We do not have the same lock to protect our rights from discrimination as we do in Northern Ireland. So my message today to you is absolutely crystal clear. Be vigilant. Every single piece of progress we can make can be overturned. Every single piece of progress will be overturned if we are not vigilant. The discrimination is systematic, it is written into the law, but it is possible with precedent, with determination, and with persistence to overturn it. That is what I intend to do. I would love your help to be able to do it. But above all, as the witches do, we need to plot. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
silence. She's Dane now, isn't she? Because she's got this Irish award, yeah. Yeah. I work very closely with her, yeah. The challenge that we've got in Parliament is not whether people consider it should be accessible to have an abortion, but people's understanding of the consequences of having a criminal underpinning of a basic healthcare matter. There is no other healthcare matter in which you are denied a right as a patient to express a view. Because if you have an abortion in England and Wales, it's only because two doctors have said, well, she'll go do Lally if she doesn't. That is not the case in Northern Ireland. Now, absolutely, in Northern Ireland, we still have issues when it comes to access. But because we wrote in this human rights perspective, um, I promise you, it, it, it gives me great pleasure because it was a battle, and there are many men in Parliament who claim to represent Northern Ireland who said this was not what people in Northern Ireland wanted. The women of Northern Ireland spoke back. And now we have the most progressive legislation in Northern Ireland. But it also means, on a practical basis, that every time those men, whether they're in the civil service, whether they're in the legal profession, because there's been many legal challenges, or whether they're in Stormont, try to stop access, the Secretary of State here has to persist. And we've seen time and time again people attempt to thwart access to abortion in Northern Ireland. We are seeing that now here in England and Wales by the decisions that have been made around buffer zones. And I'll wager that you'll see it as people will seek to challenge any moves towards decriminalisation by taking away access to telemedicine. Because we have that human rights lock on what is done, our human rights trump their ability to argue that it is their human right. So it becomes a balance of rights. But in Northern Ireland, for example, they have buffer zones because those are written into CEDAW. Here in England and Wales, the government has actually tried to argue that the right to religious expression trumps the right to privacy. It doesn't, because you have an absolute right to religious belief. You don't have a right to express your beliefs wherever you want to do. But those are the battles that we are facing. That's why I say there is systemic discrimination, because we start from the perspective on something as basic as abortion, that those men who wish to shout, and there are some women too, have an equal right as opposed to a woman having a right to an abortion, given the impact that it will have on her life to not be able to make that choice if she wishes. I absolutely share your concern on human rights and taking a human rights approach. I think in that the NHS constitution, um, which was republished in August, it was great to see this statement about the rights and responsibilities of staff and patients. But there was a bit of a Freudian slip, because as they rehearsed the protected characteristics, they left out sex. And so even though we're a service that employs 70 to 80 percent women, sometimes we're in that Thatcher paradox of women in leadership who aren't necessarily helping all of our women across all of our spectrum and across all of our experiences. And so I would also urge you to think about things like the NHS EDI Improvement Plan, which ignores the Human Rights Act, ignores the opportunity for transformation and change by concentrating on the failed project of protected characteristics. I actually think there's a much more present threat, frankly, in the NHS because we've seen a number of those. And let me be clear, I will always defend the right of people to oppose abortion. We live in a democracy. I will always defend the right of people to speak up for issues that, and viewpoints that I disagree with. What I won't defend is them harassing people in the process of doing it or not doing it in an open and democratic manner. And actually what we're seeing in the NHS is a concerted effort to organise those people who are anti-abortion to use their position to challenge. So, for example, we've seen concerns being raised with um, ambulance drivers that if you were to find a woman who may be experiencing a late-term uh, miscarriage, to question whether she might have taken pills. Um, the Royal College of uh, Gynaecology, the, the, the legend that is Dame Leslie, has been trying to catalogue some of this. So, actually, I see a very clear and present... From what you're saying, look, one of the problems here is that human rights as a concept is under threat. Um, you know... 
I hate to use the B word, but we all thought with Brexit at least they might be satisfied. Now the European Court of Human Rights is, uh, is, is under threat. And actually, it is particularly those who are left out of conversations, and that is women, people of colour, people from ethnic minority backgrounds, people from LGBTQ plus backgrounds who are left out of those conversations. So it is their rights that are first coming. And I tell you this, the government has already brought in legislation that removes the right to remedy for refugees. They're not going to stop there. And the arguments about Rwanda are particularly difficult because people have sort of said, well, it's immigration policy. If they can do it with refugees, they'll start to do it with women and so on. Um, but I just want to pick up on something you said there, because absolutely, I'm with Madeleine Albright, but I'm also not going to let, and I'm going to let the one man in the room I can see feel very uncomfortable at this point, <laughs> men off the hook. Two, marvellous. Well, thank God's sake, three men in a room. God. I was like, Parliament, we've got, you know, we've had three women in some sort of leadership position. We've got equality. Equality benefits everybody. Human rights benefit everybody. When we protect people's rights, we deliver emancipation and freedom because we free people from the discrimination that holds them back and then they are more likely to do amazing, brilliant things for our world. So it is in everybody's interest to fight for them, not just because you have had a lived experience of discrimination, but because you live in a society that is scarred by discrimination. So I'm not going to let my male colleagues off the hook, either for their ignorance or absence or engagement from these debates. I'm going to hold everyone to account because it's in everyone's interests, including you three, to make sure we change these things. I don't want, uh, I'm one of those uh, members of the Royal College of Obstetricians, Gynecologists. It's music to my ears. Let's not talk about the word sex, but another language issue. I noticed you use the uh, late term. I think you've got to be really careful. This has come from fundamentalist Christians. It isn't late term. We need to talk about the trimesters. We need to talk about gestation and we need to talk about weeks. But um, the images and the marketing and the shroud waving and the scareness, late term, term is 38 to 42 weeks and late term is a concept, early term, late term. Please be careful because we're all infected by the, the, um, the influencers and uh, we, we, we give something to the people who are not on our side. So, uh, I, but language and accuracy and precision, they're very old-fashioned concepts, I guess. No, and, and look, I take your point. I do think those of us who are campaigning for decriminalisation need to recognise and respect that there is a difference between abortions that happen at a very late part in the process and abortions that happen early on, after all, the vast majority happen early on. Those people who are campaigning against do not care about that distinction. Actually, the British public do. And I, I would caution those people who think that we can change the law without recognising that because we've had this criminal foundation so long and we've had that term limit, that that doesn't matter anymore. And certainly the work I'm doing and the amendments I'm looking at are trying to strike that balance because absolutely nobody wants to see... Carla Foster in prison, I don't think we also want to encourage people to take pills without medical supervision at a late stage pregnancy. And we need to make sure that we strike that balance because otherwise what will happen is telemedicine will be removed. And we know that the vast majority of women now are accessing abortion through telemedicine. So I can see some very dangerous moves within Parliament and I can see some people seeking to use those opportunities to close off abortion access Altogether. That's why I go back to that Human Rights Foundation, because actually what CEDAW says is that measures should not be punitive. And what I do not want to see is any well-intentioned regulation that reflects any change in the law ending up being punitive and therefore restricting and limiting access. Because frankly, we know that access is not equal across the country and that we know that access is still all too often built not on medical need or the, the requests of the woman, but on the people making the decisions. And that, again, is an area of healthcare policy that we've never really untangled what discrimination that looks like. So I absolutely take your point. I also just think we, shan't, we shouldn't pretend that what she did wasn't a big deal, because it was. Yeah. Hi. Yes, okay, I'll be quick. Hi, I'm Rebecca Steinfeld. I'm Hello. from BPAS. I'm also a huge fan. Thank you so much for your vigilance um, in Parliament and all of your energy and activity. Um, I wondered if you would join with me in encouraging everybody in this room to take action um, in what will probably be a sort of once at least in a parliamentary cycle opportunity that's coming up in probably two weeks to decriminalise 
abortion for women um, in an amendment to the criminal justice bill that's been tabled by your Labour colleague, um, Diana mm -hmm. Johnson, um, and sort of in, in asking everyone here, men and women alike, um, to write to their MPs, to use all the levers in their professional and social networks to try to actually bring about a very significant change sure. um, for women. I understand where you're coming from. I have tried to work with yourselves and with Diana. I fear that falls into the trap we've just talked about. So I am going to say to you, as I've tried to say to people, I'm going to try and come up with something that I think can bridge those gaps and can be protected. Because my biggest concern and my biggest fear, having been involved in the campaigns around buffer zones, we didn't see what they've done on buffer zones coming. So we thought we'd won the argument in Parliament, we'd won the legislation, and then wallop in the Lords, they put in a, a piece of legislation that stopped it being implemented and now means that this is consultation. And in that consultation is a way of overturning buffer zones. For example, we had a debate in Parliament and we had a vote against the idea that somehow silent prayer should be allowed in a buffer zone. So we had a democratic moment. This consultation says, well, of course, silent prayer must be allowed. Anyone who's been to an abortion clinic knows that people praying outside is disruptive. It is harassment for somebody who's made that most personal decision just doesn't want to be bothered. We have to learn the lessons from that. That's why I'm keen to make sure we have that lock. I'm also keen to make sure we recognise that removing the criminal law in its entirety creates some of these conditions, some of these situations that we've seen with Carla Foster, because I can tell from my colleagues in Parliament that they feel uncomfortable about that stuff. My offer is always open to work with BPAS. My offer is always open to try and get these things right. I hope BPAS might be willing to support the amendment that we're just crafting now to put down that tries to address these problems. The big question for all of us is we've got this opportunity. Are we going to use it? Because although I recognise absolutely you must have looked at Parliament last night and thought you've all lost your way, <laughs> the progress can always be made. And it behoves all of us, including campaign organisations, to think about how they can move to, to finding that progress. So there is progress we made on abortion. I don't think we're there yet on what's currently on the order paper. I'm hoping we can move it forward in the next couple of weeks. And then absolutely, yes, please, please do bang the drum. Because if we don't do this, we'll probably miss an opportunity for the next 10 years.